Reverend Elita. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Uh, when I was standing, toy toying outside Parliament three years ago today, I didn't think that I'd be standing on this platform discussing these issues. But let me also welcome you. Uh, are you still your worship, the mayor? Uh, our public protector, uh, ladies and gentlemen, friends. <clears throat> Today we're reflecting on a set of hugely significant political decisions announced 34 years ago. Those decisions laid the basis for the inexorable and irrevocable changes that are manifested in our Constitution. One of the challenges that confronts us is how to ensure that successive generations are kept aware of the journey that our country traversed. By my reckoning, uh, uh, Jordan, I think you may have been like four years old when all of this stuff happened. <laughs> Three, sorry. Three. Now, it's a fundamentally important issue because that journey needs to be embedded and taken forward, and you can't pretend that it's just something that ha happened on one fine day all those years ago. You see, because if we don't deal with these issues adequately, if we don't embed the experiences adequately, the risk is always that history may repeat itself in strange ways. In fact, part of, part of the challenge that confronts us as a people is that from time to time, there are still flare-ups of the residue of the past. You can look at Hroblerstal today and know about it. You can look at those events in Brackenfell a few years ago and know about it. Societies have to deal with difficult issues so that they can progress together. <clears throat> President F.W. de Klerk uh, took the plunge with an impact on each of the troika of responsibilities held, and bear in mind he'd been President for all of four months when the 2nd of February came along. But there's a troika of responsibilities, and the decisions announced had an impact on each of those discrete responsibilities. As head of state, he was talking to the nation about fundamental change of itself. As head of a party that had been in power for 42 years, and long stays in power tend to create stasis, and so taking that on becomes an unbelievable challenge. And then as head of government, understanding the consequences of moving beyond apartheid was an unbelievably important challenge. And I'm saying part of our recall of those events of the 2nd of February 1990 is to understand that the decisions had an impact on each of the three response, core responsibilities that F.W. de Klerk had uh, on that day. And the three responsibilities, that of head of state, head of government, and, sorry, head of state, uh, 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 head of party, and uh, 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 head, of, head of government, uh, still shapes the way in which our politics are shaped in South Africa. So we can continue to debate and even contest matters such as the impulses that led to the 2nd of, 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 of February 1990 and the conditions that led to those decisions or how much persuasion was required to reach them. But we cannot debate the impact of those decisions on each aspect of everyday life in South Africa. This is what we reflect on and recognize here today. The most fundamental and consequential manifestations that flowed from the decisions announced 34 years ago are now embodied in our constitution, as Dave said earlier. It's critical that we remind ourselves that it took six and a quarter years from that date, six and a quarter years of hard negotiations to adopt the constitution. These were years that were characterized by intense pain, contested tough negotiations, the loss of too many lives, and ultimately the joy of an election that spoke of a new nation and new possibilities. But notwithstanding that journey of six and a quarter years, the conclusions are indelibly there for all time, as articulated in the preamble 
the founding provisions in the Bill of Rights of our Constitution. I'm saying that it's quite important to remember what transpired in those six and a quarter years as well, because we must never believe that change in society happens just by announcement. It's always unbelievably difficult, and there are always vested interests that need to be dealt with. But if you don't have a beginning, you don't attain anything. And as we speak now of the Constitution, the intentions are clear, but we need to remind ourselves that we're talking of politics, which uh, not necessarily for everybody in this room, if I recognize the faces, it's always a complex topic. The outcomes depend on the nature of the mandate that political parties secure, on the communications of government with the populace, and on the ability of the body politic to assist on accountability. I'd like to suggest that these become part of our discussions here today. We may want to pause and consider the extent of changes that technology and real-time communications have on the context of politics or the conduct of politics. The reality is now that are starker than they were 34 years ago. Almost a decade ago, the then president of Chile, Michelle Bachelet, addressed an audience in the city and she said, and I quote, Societies want to be consulted in a more complex and complete manner than just through their votes. Stemming from this demand, a new objective is one for our institutions and for citizens themselves. And this demand to raise our standards beyond the strict legal sense, giving rise to new forms of dialogue and so social consultation, is the key to legitimizing the entire modern democratic system." Unquote. In other words, there's a mismatch between, our avail uh, uh, of, between information available in real time and the fact that across the world, citizens are expected to wait for five years before they can exercise a vote. How do you bring these, how do you bring the realities together differently? It's a fundamentally important question. I suggest that Madame Bachelet's observations are exceedingly important in South Africa now as we grapple with trying to understand what works, what is not, and why. Importantly, we must continually engage in discussions about how we can improve not just the political institutions, but all of society. There's probably a surfeit of observations from the press and especially on social media platforms on how broken things are. So I'd like to spare you the detail of potholes and water and electricity and um, perhaps our guest from Conrad Adenauer told us about those things. I'd like to spare you that. Similarly, there's no shortage of policy advice. And I don't want to be too precious about the outcomes of the National Development Plan. But it is worth reminding ourselves that as a broad framework of matters in need of urgent attention, these have been well canvassed in the chapters of the NDP. Granted that almost 12 years have elapsed since the document was handed to all political parties in Parliament, all of whom accepted the framework, with some obvious disagreements on the margins, this is, after all, politics we are talking about. I'd like to suggest that the data sets are probably now too dated, but the essential identification of the actions necessary to produce the kind of country envisaged in our constitution remains. There was an interesting exercise because uh, the members of the National Planning Commission were put together without any experience, uh, carte blanche, what will you do about the issues? And we had an interesting debate. Uh, we looked at the preamble to our constitution and one of the sharp-witted members of the commission said, is this covered by the Official Secrets Act? Why do we not talk about it as a people? And so that was the baseline that we started with. If that is the intention of democracy, how do you produce different outcomes? And that then gave rise to uh, the formation and the crafting of the National Development Plan. Regrettably, over the 12 years since it was handed to government and the parties in parliament, there's insufficient evidence of a concerted plan for implementation. 
I'll spare you this afternoon the rehearsal of what the NDP covers. Yet there are some of those aspects that still need to be front-loaded. For example, the task to build a capable and developmental state has become an increasingly important priority. There's been an accent this has been accentuated also by the work of the Zondo Commission that devoted a large body of work to the discussion of the political administrative interface. Strip away the jargon, and this explains that ministers and senior public servants have different responsibilities. <clears throat> the same holds true at provincial and local government. If you ask yourself, for example, what are the powers and responsibilities of the, of the, that the South African Police Services Act designates for the Minister of Police as distinct from those given to the Commissioner, could you in all honesty say that you do? Because if you don't, it's also worth looking at Chapter 10 and Chapter 11 of the Constitution. Chapter 10 deals with public services generally, and Chapter 11 deals with all of the security services, and there's a big chunk devoted to what you expect of the minister and commissioner of police. I'm saying that they each have discrete responsibilities in law, in the constitution and in law, but in the public mind, there is no distinction between one and the other, I submit. And these are the issues that I think spell enormous difficulties for our Constitution. We may not remember, but the Constitution in that same chapter, 11, also creates a different institution, the Civilian Secretariat of Police. I think it was abandoned a number of years ago. And so we've got to go back and ask these tough questions because if crime is a problem, we've got to understand what the institutions are meant to prevent crime and deal with it in society. But I could have selected any other cabinet position or department, not just the police, and the same issues all true. Because the primary task of a minister is to hold public servants in the relevant departments accountable for planning and organizing their work and for the utilization of public finances. There's little that gives us the assurance that this is actually how the administration functions presently. Let me emphasize that the essence is researched and well articulated, but unfortunately ignored to date, is that the political administrative interface be strengthened. This focus will need public service, and I want to quote from the National Development Plan, I won't bore you, it's the only quote I'll use from there, quote, immersed in the developmental agenda, but insulated from political interference, unquote. <clears throat> Resolving these matters is actually the task of governance. It's worth reminding ourselves that the Constitution sets out, quote, the principles according to which a state is to be governed. The Constitution distinctly does not substitute for the continuous act of governing, which is about assigning roles and responsibilities, overseeing the raising and allocation of resources, and being held accountable for all of this. This is the first and most critical breakdown in the South African polity. Calling it out for purposes of seeking remedy is surely our number one task as South Africans. The second issue, and consequent upon the first is the functioning of the institutions of the executive at national, provincial, and local governments, or levels, or spheres, if you must, <clears throat> and to, to ensure that all of these are held accountable. This is a serious, if badly underrated, task. One of the key matters relating to the accountability is of members of parliament themselves, and you can say, as lawyers would, uh, mutatis mutandis, provincial legislatures, and even municipal government. Paul Holden, in reflecting on the outputs of the Zondo Commission, <clears throat> observes, and I quote, it noted, the Zondo Commission, that is, that MPs, upon being sworn in, were bound by an, by an oath to act in the best interests of the country. 
Surely, the Commission argued, MP should be bound to this oath rather than the directions of a political party that might be compromised by its own corruption and inaction, unquote. Finding a solution to this intractable issue is the second paramount task. The third task relates to measurement of effort and change. There's an important presumption in the preamble to the Constitution that states that the purpose of adopting the Constitution itself <coughs> is to, amongst other tasks, quote, improve the quality of life of all citizens and free the potential of each person, as Dave reminded us earlier. <coughs> if we either do not have the measurements or do not trust those that are produced, how will we ever know that governments in each sphere are making an effort to implement the constitution that requires a continuous improvement in the quality of life of citizens? As the old adage states, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. It's important to apply the same norm to every aspect of public services, education, healthcare, the built environment, policing, access to energy, water, and sanitation. No public services can be spared from scrutiny because the quality of each of our lives is measured by an amalgam of all of these functions. <clears throat> but the third task about access is also split into two. It's, it's, about, it's about public services, but it's also about the benefits brought by a growing inclusive economy where a range of matters such as employment, Employment creation, battles against inflation, access to food, groceries, goods and services are all within reach. The first part is actually provided for. That's the public services and the budgeting process. Each department actually contracts with parliament. Now, this is a, this is a state secret. They contract with parliament, and the contracts are bound in a big, fat document called the Estimates of National Expenditure. It's about 1,200 pages. It'll be released in a few days' time, in 19 days' time, alongside the budget. And every department has to explain to all of us as citizens what they will do with the money that will be announced on that occasion. We don't know that it exists in that form, but it does. And so part of my invitation today is be more interested in what those commitments are. And then you can follow through because on a monthly basis, in terms of the Public Finance Management Act, they're actually, they're, they're actual expenditures of the past month. So you can, you can see their deviations. And we need to take the information and use it to ensure that the quality of life improves because if we don't do that, we aren't living constitutional values either. So that's the first, that's the public services. And the second part, I think, relates to a series of proper engagements between government and business representatives, focused on finding solutions to agreed problems, holding out that increasing numbers of people on welfare grants is a victory for democracy, actually disrespects the constitutional values and the poor themselves. The fourth task. <clears throat> And now it's Friday afternoon. I'm really getting to, into trouble. It's OK. The fourth task relates to securing the public representatives that South Africa deserves. I'm aware that there's a very important debate on cons constituency base versus proportional representation. I'm not sure that it quite works. Uh, Mayor, where you find yourself in local government because we have a ward-based system and, and a PR system, I don't think it works. My submission to you is that it doesn't have to be one or the other. There's actually no prohibition on all reasonable political parties letting their candidate choices be known before the elections and society then setting the basis for local debates, which must include matters such as the frequency of engagement and that all important questions of conscience and oath versus that matter called the party whip. The idea that party bosses alone determine who the representatives of the people will be, it's funny. 
they determine who the representatives of the people will be, has to be the most anti-democratic measure. Obviously, the same holds true for party bosses who can capriciously dismiss public representatives. I forget who they are, but it's <laughs> frequent practice in some parties. <laughs> the fifth task <clears throat> is to have open and public discussions about the operations of each of our major institutions of governance. Looking back to this day 34 years ago, the what-if question has to arise, imagine the body politic had changed with time and not ossified. How easier the changes would have been. It's sometimes easy to look outside of ourselves at other institutions, and I, I came across an interesting factoid that the United Nations Security Council held its first meeting on the 17th of January, 1946 when the UN had 51 members. The institution retains all of the same operational rules, including veto powers, notwithstanding the fact that the UN now has 194 members. You cannot find a better example of ossific institutional ossification anywhere. For our collective survival, we must recognize that periodic elections are woefully in an inadequate corrective measure, we must build in opportunities for review and adjustment to prevent crises that appear unsolvable. But these tasks are eminently solvable. We must commit to tackling them if we value democracy. For those of us with memories that are long enough, we know what life was like without democracy. We can neither take it for granted nor neglect the responsibility to refresh its tenets and, and presence and ensure that successive generations of South Africa cherish, cherish it in much the same way. I'd like to conclude with a few thoughts from the Brazilian thinker Roberto Mangabeira Unga, who in his seminal work that he called Empowered Democracy, speaks of five necessary institutional innovations. These are raising the temperature of politics, and it's temperature, not the volume. Raising the temperature of politics. Secondly, hastening the pace of politics. Thirdly, combining central power and local initiative. Fourthly, establishing distinct authority to rescue excluded and disadvantaged groups. And finally, gradually enhancing representative democracy through participative democracy. It's surely within our grasp to modernize and effect the necessary changes, if anything. We owe it to the brave and bold decisions of 34 years ago today and to the intensive negotiations that followed to craft our great constitution. Now we, rec now we recognize is the challenge. The challenge for us is to do far more than merely have the constitution. It has to be lived. To live it requires a task of governing within its rules in the interests of the many. Thank you very much. <clears throat>